Between Games, supporting community sport. Proudly brought to you by Gibbs Sport. Welcome to episode three of Between Games. My name's Gene Perini from Gibbs Sport, and I'm joined by my colleague Michelle Harris. How are you, Michelle? Great, Gene. Um, really excited about appearing on my first Gibbs Sport podcast. Um, I like to talk, so hopefully it'll be a natural um, progression into something, a different way of working with sporting clubs and getting our information out there. Um, how are you going? I'm good. Yeah, I'm really excited about the topic today. We're going to be talking about positive coaching and how club culture um, intertwines with that. Um, I'm really fascinated. We've got a couple of great guests from the um, Women's National Basketball League team, the Deakin Melbourne Boomers, in head coach Guy Malloy and chairman Tony Hallam. So I think their experiences of building a club culture uh, at the Boomers since uh, 2016 and how uh, guys coaching philosophy intertwines with that will be really fascinating. And then uh, we've got uh, our colleague, Damon Francis, who's going to join us and talk about uh, uh, the positive coaching workshop that uh, we've got uh, coming up next week. Um, so that'll be really good to to hear from Damon and get an understanding of what's been, uh, what work's been done in regards to that area. So, well, Michelle, I know you, you've coached and been involved in many clubs uh, across across the years. Um, look, is there one experience in particular that you find interesting in, in regards to this topic of positive coaching and club culture? Yeah, I think um, I've had lots of different coaching experiences and it really resonates with me in that I think if you can really relate to kids and create this positive, fun environment that everyone has a much more enjoyable experience. And a good example of that is over the summers, over the last 12 years, I've worked with the Inverloch Surf Life Saving Club as a um, nippers program leader or an age manager. Okay. Yep. And yeah, over the two weeks, I spent my summer um, mornings out with um, the different age groups and um, working with them to build their confidence and see how they progress over the two weeks and get to know each other and how I get to um, work with the individuals is really um, enjoyable. It's something I look forward to every year. Yeah, awesome. So, um, you know, for myself, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, this topic. I'm really passionate about this topic. Um, so when you talk about the, the Nippers program, um, do you actually coach? Are you involved in the in the coaching side of it or is it the club culture type that you're invested in? I think luckily in Surf Life Saving, there is such a positive culture about why you're there and what the purpose of the Nippers program is. Um, but as an individual age manager, I had up to 30 um, young people. So this year I did the under 13s and yeah, We've got skills that we're trying to teach them, but we mix that up with games and trying to um, build rapport with them so they have that confidence to go out there in the water and um, develop and achieve some goals and also compete. There's some some young people that also like to compete in surf life saving as well. So it has all elements and um, I think all sport really something we've learned through our increasing access to sport program is that young people are all there for different reasons and what they're hoping to get out of it. So um, I'm sure we'll hear that from the boomers today as well, that we've got different personalities out there to work with. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm always really fascinated with that, um, the difference between, or people see differences between um, elite and grassroots community sport. But I, I, I actually believe that there's um, a real synergy between both on this topic. I think um, grassroots sports and you know, professional teams like we're going to speak to the boomers today actually have a lot more in common than them, what they uh, acknowledge. And, um, you know, making sure that the, uh, the coaching is positive and um, there's a fun environment for both professional and uh, community participants is vital for the coach getting the best out of uh, the players. And um, like you mentioned, um, if they're enjoying what they're doing, it's going to be, um, the coach is going to actually have a much more um, be um, better opportunity for them to to progress and, um, you know, uh, progress in the sport and enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I know that um, you do a lot of soccer coaching, Jean. So what are you missing most about your coaching? 
Uh, oh, definitely that, um, you know, one-to-one -one coaching, you know, physically being in a, in a session, um, you know, the little conversations you have with the players, um, you know, and like you said, everyone's different. So you need different coaching styles for, for different players. Um, some like just instruction and they'll get on with it. Others like it explained a bit more. They might need it demonstrated. Um, getting to know, you know, what sort of day that player is having and that you may have to adapt on the day as well. So, um, yeah, when we say positive coaching, I think it's really important to um, to realise that it's um, just being open as a coach and being able to to adapt to the particular session and situation and, and person. So, so look, um, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to um, the topic and um, yeah, look forward to the chat we're going to have. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome our two guests today um, from Deakin Melbourne Boomers um, in head coach Guy Malloy and current chairman Tony Hallam. Welcome guys. Hello. Good to be here. Thanks so much for um, giving us your time today. Um, the topic today um, around positive coaching and how club um, culture fits in with that is um, a really important one at grassroots level for us and we imagine it's it's really important um, at your level, at the elite level. Um, Guy, just firstly, um, how are things um, with the, the current situation, the coronavirus? How's, how's life impacted you at the moment? Well, things are different. For sure. Um, I uh, am, am usually at this time of the year doing two things. I, uh, I have a, a second position as the head coach of the New Zealand national team, and we're normally firmly in preparation for some FIBA Asian, Asian event. Uh, so that's all put on hold at the moment. And then the other thing with the boomers is that we're normally in the cut and thrust of the free agency period uh, particularly looking around our import positions and what we do there. But of course, uh, that's um, as uh, unknown or unsettled yet as, as many things are around uh, our league and, and sport in general. So it is a different time. Yeah. Thanks so much. And Tony, how's, um, how's life impacted you at the moment with what's going on? Oh, very similar, I suppose, Gene. Um, you know, things are just different um, but I think um, I think we've found as an organization that uh, we've handled it pretty well we've we've had to change the way we operate one of the things that's certainly quite different I think is the level of communication and connection we're having with our people at this time of the year I think uh, to guys point it, it tends to be you're never really in an off season but you tend to go into a bit of a quiet period whereas yeah. we've probably upped the level of uh, engagement and communication to our, I'll call it our, our 50 people within our organisation, um, in part because many of them usually go off, uh, particularly players and coaches, to be involved in other programs, and those other programs just have been cancelled yeah. because of COVID-19. So we've felt um, a need and an opportunity and probably a requirement to stay connected, more connected with our people. And we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of that has quite an impact on workloads and the way you do things. And probably even this is a great example of we'd probably, you know, three months Slow ago down. we would have all tried to drive down to Gippsland and get in a room together and do this, whereas how quickly things have changed. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, now we're going to move on to the to the topic at hand, um, and um, you know, in regards to uh, the club culture set up at the club. So, um, um, Michelle, do you want to? Yeah, so I'm really excited to be able to chat with you today, Tony. I work a, a lot with club governance. Um, so, as the um, the chair there of the Deakin Melbourne Boomers, you have um, I'm sure a lot of weight on your shoulders, and um, probably. A lot of value um, to give to this session and I see that you're a chartered accountant and um, also being a former chairman of Etihad Stadium as well as working with FFA and Golf Australia so lots of different experience there um, and it's been fascinating watching all the different sports during this time as well and how they're handling it so um, thanks very much so um, can you tell us when you started as chairman there um, how did you develop the club culture? 
Well, Michelle, it's, it's an interesting question because we came into an organisation or inherited an organisation that was was about to be closed down. Um, the Bulleen Temple State Basketball Association had been running the Boomers for 33 years and done an amazing job over that period. They'd started the program. It's the oldest professional women's sporting team in any sport in Australia. Um, so w it came with a lot of legacy, but uh, they, for a range of reasons, had handed the licence back to Basketball Australia, and therefore we were both becoming a new ownership group to run the club, but also we were inheriting this 34 years or 33 years of heritage. So it wasn't like we were starting a brand new club. So if you take somebody like uh, Western United, who started in the A-League this year, they started literally with a clean sheet of paper. So we had a, a very interesting time in that first year determining did we sort of rush, if you like, at trying to put down what we thought our values and culture should be, or did we sit back a little bit and observe and, and learn? And we probably took the second approach, which we had a very experienced coach in uh, Guy Malloy, who's starting his eighth year with us as head coach. Um, we had an experienced general manager who'd been with um, the Boomers for about 18 months before we took over. Um, and we were probably new ourselves, you know, that we'd all been involved somewhere in either community sport or uh, basketball or uh, obviously business. But we had to get to know each other as well. So there were seven of us on the board. We have a company secretary as well. So there's a lot of settling in. And we just determined, I think, in the initial stages to not try to define ourselves too quickly and probably find our way a little bit, um, which led us to the end of our first year. Uh, and uh, we'd learned a lot. And one of the things that we, we perhaps had particularly learned was we just needed some signposts for us to perhaps have reference points in making decisions, because as in any club, professional clubs are really no different to um, community clubs, and that is there's decisions that have to be made, there are policies that need to be made, there are often decisions about people, is how did you create, how could we get some signposts? Um, and that's where we did uh, a year of work on uh, what we believe our purpose is as an organisation, and then secondly, what were the values that we believed needed to define how we behaved. Yeah, really um, important stuff. And how did you create or um, connect with your community values during that process? Did you set out some specific goals? Because I, I noticed that it, when you look at your material, it really comes across that community connection is really important. Um, well, I think it was a it's a good example of something that was inherently there and needed to be overtly expressed and then once you overtly express it, it's amazing how it draws people back to that message consistently. So it's a bit of a virtuous circle. If you define, you know, I, I'm a believer, you've got to decide, you can't be all things to all people. So just make conscious decisions about what you want to be and why you want to be it. And then bring yourself constantly back to that in, in terms of questioning. So Guy will talk a little bit later about then how you might interconnect that with your recruitment policy or strategy probably a better way of putting it is a strategy not so much a policy but how do you approach bringing people into the organization and we've learned um we've learned as you go that's the other bit is to how do you you're going to make mistakes you're going to well mistakes is probably the wrong word again it's probably you make better decisions as you go because you just have more experience but our starting point was to decide what we needed to be and wanted to be, and the community piece we thought was a crucial piece of what we wanted to be and why many of the the owners were motivated to be involved. That was the first thing. And the second was we actually think it's a pretty fundamental um, piece to how we become a sustainable business and club. Yeah, fantastic. We have um, a Changing Gippsland Games Women's Leadership Network. Yep. Um, and I see that a lot of your community work is linked directly around empowering um, women and girls through basketball programs. So could you tell us a bit about the work you do there? Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's not easy. Um, you know, one of the – an example of a change is that uh, we wanted our players to be fully professional 
uh, when the first the, the first four years, I think, Guy, of your coaching, the players trained at night. Um, yep. And that because in some of them had jobs or coaches had jobs or whatever it might be, um, one of the first steps was um, to be able to, to train in the morning from 9 to 12 and then for the players to be able to go and do their strength and conditioning twice a week. So suddenly that enables you, you've moved players to being more full-time professional and then from a community piece, they're then more available to do things in the community because um, if you're going to schools, you need to be going between 9 and 3. There's no point going at 5 o'clock. If you're going to an early uh, childhood learning centre, which we have a very strong community link with Knox City Council, well, you need to be going during their times, not at seven o'clock at night. If you're going to go and visit Gippsland and do things in Gippsland, you can't just do it on the weekend. So that first step was to, uh, in terms of being enabling a lot of this stuff, was to find enough funding and resources to move the players to more a more full-time professional basis. Yeah, that's really fantastic to to learn more about. Um, and in terms of the board sets up a um, a framework for the coaching values or the culture. Do you is that something that you do? No, I think the the coaching piece and the playing piece. I think it's been a really interesting learning and piece for us over the last probably two years. And that is, they they really have to come together. I think if the board simply imposes what it wants or believes in on the playing group and the coaching group, I think that's fraught with danger. And similarly, if the playing group and the coaching group are view themselves as separate from the values of the club completely, that's fraught with danger. But it's a very delicate ecosystem because I think one of my learnings from this, um, and I've learned a lot from uh, the man who's with us today in Guy Malloy is players want, players come focused on their basketball. And if you try to impose too heavily, uh, too quickly, the culture within the organisation, um, it can rub, I think, both ways, the wrong way. So I think what we've probably learnt in the last couple of years is to let that um, mature and not rush it. Um, but not give up on it either, because that's the other thing. As I go, we'll talk a little bit later around our recruitment strategy. Is um, nurture it, create some parameters, create some signposts, enforce it when you need to. So you know, don't be shy to to hold to your values, but but don't be black and white about it, because words mean different things to different people, as as you might see in some of the documents we've shared. You know, what I might view as integrity, somebody else could view a different way with integrity. So conversations become important and, then, and also just allowing enough time for that to be, um, I suppose, oh, it, it might be a good word, is to percolate that so that it becomes not a uh, set of compliance documents, but actually becomes viewed as a positive signpost as to how you might make and be guided on decisions. Yeah, that's a really good point in that um, these COVID-19 times in that as we return to sport, um, our committees and board structures are going to need to be adaptable and fluid in how they adjust, how they run their clubs or um, sport or coaching opportunities as well. So um, really good points there and a perfect segue over to you, Jean. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Tony. Um, really fascinating um, <clears throat> how you mentioned how you're evolving the club culture. You didn't rush in to try and, you know, stamp um, the, your, you know, imprint on it. You've allowed it to organically happen, which is, um, yeah, it's really interesting. So uh, have a chat now with Guy. Um, Guy, you know, when I was reading up on your coaching career, it's, it's, um, you know, it's amazing achievements. 30 years as a coach, been involved in play a pathway to, you know, the highest level, elite level in both um, men's and women's basketball. Um, notice you notched up 250 uh, WNBL games recently. Um, can I ask you firstly, um, when, when we talk about club culture, how does that impact your coaching philosophy or what you do as a coach? Mm, I think they're... Um... 
they're uh, tightly entwined. Um, it, it was um, it was an excellent exercise I felt when uh, our new ownership and board, chaired by Tony, came into the club, and uh, you know that's as objective a time as they're ever going to be. And uh, they can have a look around, and and they asked a lot of questions, and and they asked me would would uh, the coaching and playing group be open to uh, uh, sort of anonymous surveying and and feedback, uh, and and we were open to it, and we we learned a lot from that. And so uh, you you're kind of curious to find out what the actual culture may be expressed by all members of your club, not just a select few. And I think that from that process that we were able to identify where we had some um, shortcomings between what was desirable and where we were actually at. And I, I think that we've done a pretty solid job in the past few years moving towards the type of culture that we want to really live. So my expression of culture, because it's a bit of a abused word these days, is it's is it's the um, the sea you swim in or the ocean you swim in. So it's hard to yeah. define, but if somebody walks through the door, then they should go, hmm, okay, I, I get an idea. If I hang around the joint for a day or two, what values kind of resonate, what sticks out? And so some of the things that we've really prized are to, are to have a empathetic or soft nurturing side to it because we we prize our um, enjoyment and fun factor and we mm. prize our positivity uh, value um, that that factor and the hard end of it is that we want to be the best and we want to contend for championships and um, have extremely high standards and go and achieve those standards so how do you manage both things how do you do them in the uh, short, mid and long term. And, and that's the challenge of it. So you often see um, that organisations and sporting clubs will sit down and brainstorm a culture. They make out a nice plaque, they nail it on the wall <laughs> and uh, they never, ever get back to it. Whereas our culture, we wanted to live and breathe it every day and refer back to it often. And then when we face major challenges, um, be they issues around um, uh, social um, controversies or on-court controversies or anything like that, then it gives us a, a map to refer back to. Um, yeah, really interesting how you mentioned how um, you use that as a bit of a, you know, a roadmap if things sort of happen. Um, is there an example are you, without, you know, giving out too much information that you, you referred to something um, in regards to your culture when when something occurred? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's in in elite sport, you can run into controversy on the court. So say, for example, over the past number of years, we've had a, a few small cases of our players that have clashed with opposition. Mm. Um, you, you know they've they've been cited, they have to go before a judiciary. Uh, the media gets involved, it becomes a very heated process. so, uh, one rival club, every bit as proud as what we are, has their side of the story. We have our side of the story and uh, we want to wrap our arms around and protect our person um, and at the same time do the right thing by the integrity of the league. Um, so to be able to have honest conversations with our individuals and our, our team about um, were we on the right end of of the controversy here? Were we doing the right things or were we doing things in a way that we don't want to be remembered for? And and um, they're always good tests. So that would be a, I think that would be a great example. Yeah. And I think Tony alluded to it earlier where, um, you know, it, it sounds like the coaches and players have brought into it and been part of what you've created as far as a culture. So, um, like all clubs, if 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 there's been that um, buy-in, when something does occur, um, people are more likely to sort of look at the culture and go, yeah, look, I've, I've probably stepped over the line, um, as opposed to, like you said, you pin it up on a wall and everyone sort of forgets it, and then when something comes up, it doesn't really um, refer to the standards of the club. So, Well, I, I'd give credit yeah. to, uh, sorry, I, 
yeah. to Tony and the board on that because I think that they've pushed us to um, examine how open we are as a coaching staff to engage with our players and get their point of view. You know, I, I've been coaching for a long, long time, and so the infancy of my career back in the in the 80s, it was my way or the highway coaching. That was the the dogma. That was the mantra yeah. back then. Yeah. Times are different now. And I think that our culture is as much created by our players and their input into that as anyone else in the organisation. Yeah. Just on that, um, I'm really fascinated. There's obviously, you know, um, potentially a lot of community coaches that will be listening and watching this. That, um, that theme of back in the day, coaches, it was my way or the highway. Um, we still see that somewhat at community level at times, probably not as much as we did in the past. And um, we're obviously talking about positive coaching and you mentioned nurturing and having empathy. Is there a message out there to a, a local community coach that you could give for the advantages of having that empathetic nurturing um, philosophy as opposed to, you know, if, you know, the players aren't listening, there's something wrong with them, not me. Do you, does that make sense? Is there something you could sure. offer to... You know, I, I think the, the number one job of all of us as coaches, particularly if you're in the, the junior or community end of it, I think that your role is to make sure that that very player, that young lad or girl, um, is busting to turn up to the next event at your sport. So if it was training Monday, that she's just busting to turn up to training on Thursday or the game on Saturday. And that's your job. Yep. So to get that done, first and foremost, it's got to be a fun environment and it's got to be a learning environment. And, you know, the the wisdom of the coach then is to instill the hard values in there as disappointment and adversity happens with losses and lack of opportunity and injuries and things that can go wrong. That's where sports are great socialiser, particularly team sports. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I really like that. Um, um, in regards to um, coaching for different personalities, is, is that, you know, something that you, you know, um, look to do within your coaching philosophy? Mm, well, it uh, th there are probably as many similarities um, as opposed to differences in uh, in individuals. And I've been fortunate to have coached um, both men and women, a lot of our greatest players, and the human traits in that have never changed. So they appreciate honesty. They appreciate uh, positivity. They appreciate clear feedback. And they appreciate fairness. And they don't want to necessarily be treated any different from their teammates. And so I think if the, the coach is able to establish those sorts of um, qualities into their own approach, that in general, your impact will be a good impact. And that's what you're after. And then certainly from there, you'll, as you analyze individuals in your team, you'll realize, as, as I've come to over time, that some are a little bit more on the harder end of it, that they they don't want the fluff. They just want coach, yep. tell me like it is. I just want to hear it. And that's often a, uh, to do with their upbringing. And some need to be nurtured past that point. They, they probably need to hear that it's okay. Life goes on. You're doing okay. Things are good. Yep. And once we settle down with that, then we can get to the issue at hand. But there is a, a platform because we're all humans. And then after that, you, you get into the individual differences. Yep. Yeah, obviously with our, our um, the work we do with community clubs and coaches, there's that theme of, you know, being adaptive. And like you said, there is that, you know, similarities between humans, but having that ability to adapt to try and get the best out of that individual. So, yeah, that's it's great to see that happens, you know, at the highest level as well. Um, as a coach, um, do you have a mentor or do you evaluate your performance um, along the way? Do you have things in place? Yeah, I, I evaluate my performance every day. Um, 
and and that's um, just due to personal philosophy I have about what we go through because it's very cyclic in nature. So there's lots of metaphors about coaching, um, at, you know, in, in team sports, individual, it's saying that it's a journey. And in some respects, it's a journey, but I think that it's a cycle that that repeats. Um, the literature on growth mindset is just uh, um, so important and so valid, I believe, and uh, that fits in with what I think about the process. So we compete and, and we have to compete very well, and that's a test. And out of that, for the most part, we fail. And you go, well, that, that sounds kind of harsh because – you never get it perfectly right. You have an opponent, you have a time, you have a standard, you have a score. So um, perfection doesn't exist. So success is for the gods in some respect. So we all fail to some degree. But out of that failure, you must learn and then you must grow and then you must reflect and jump back into the arena. So that's a cycle that happens all the time. And the learn, grow, reflect piece means that you can, what you should be able to do is shake quickly off disappointment, failure, and or wins and triumphs and get back to improving what it is you do. And I was fortunate. I had, I had some um, superb mentors earlier in my coaching career. Uh, Lindsay Gaze, who was the um, Olympic coach for Australia and, um, Melbourne Tigers coach and, and Brian Gorgian, who was the um, Southeast Melbourne Magic coach and, and also Australian Olympic coach, were, were very, um, um, you know, well, I, I can't um, overstate how much they meant to, to my yeah. career. So they were outstanding mentors and, and they remain so. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like you've got a really yeah, amazingly rounded approach to coaching. So it's, um, yeah, so really interesting to hear thanks for sharing that um we we have noticed that chelsea d'angelo comes from trelgan gippsland um so we we you know we have to mention a local um she's on your roster in regards to pathway for for young girls in regional areas um how important do you think that is as a as a coach at, at the highest level well uh, we've been fortunate to have um a number of players that have been in our program from this area and uh, very talented ones and uh, Chelsea's joins that list and um, having had a country upbringing of my own um, and seeing the number of country athletes that do um, you know kind of make it in the end it's it's really gratifying so I think that the things are you're probably going to get far less structure in your early basketball experiences and perhaps far less access to the highest level of competitions that you might get in metro areas. Now, my belief is that that's a blessing and a curse. Okay. And so never forget the fun, why I'm doing my sport in the first place as you're growing up, because I think that uh, country areas just offer you the best opportunity to get out with, with the, the, the primal part of the sport, a ball and a hoop, and shoot for hours or get a friend out and play one-on-one -on -one or whatever sport that you do. So yeah. you can't, you can't forget that part. And so the imagination kicks in and then you'll hopefully, um, you, you know, get some good coaching there along the way and, and find out a few things or be taught a few things fundamentally. And you put those things together and you get a very uh, unique approach to your own game. Now um, back in 2013, uh, I was asked by uh, Country Vic Basketball to coach their under-18 men's team. And it put me in a bit of a unique situation at the time because I was the apparently the only coach in the history of Victorian basketball to have coached a Metro under-18 men's team at an Australian championship and then a country team. Okay. And, and, the, and the distinctions, the, the differences were, were pretty noticeable. Okay. And when we prepared the country team, uh, we would bring them into a, a region. Uh, I think we did a couple of camps in Ballarat and, and one in Geelong. And the kids would all bring their sleeping bag 
and we we go into the local YMCA or, or equivalent type venue, and the kids would all sleep on the floor, and the team manager and parents <laughs> would come in and make the meals and the sandwiches. So I, that that was very very reminiscent of my sporting youth. And in comparison, the metro things were far different. You know, it was it was a highly uh, regimented and and um, driven by logistics and facilities, and it was a bit more of a a military process, so to speak, and and uh, you know both were fantastic, and and they had their strengths and advantages. But to me, the identity of the kids that were playing for the country teams really came through, because they had a uniqueness about their individual approach to it, and then found a way through their uh, community field to to cobble that together. So I reckon that 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 for any young player listening realize that yes there may be some things that you're missing out on that you could look and say well the grass is greener in a bigger city but there are so many advantages that you've got just by getting out uh, using your own imagination having fun with what you do picking up some uh, fundamentals when you can here and there and and uh, you know you'll find a way to move forward yeah that's a fantastic message for our um our Gippsland athletes um to know that could I add just add a couple of comments um, just about Chelsea? I, think. I mean, I think Chelsea's a, Chelsea's 20, 20 years of age, and she's yeah. about to start her fourth year with the Boomers. So she joined us as a guy as a seventeen-year-old. Um, she's studying law at Deakin University. Wow. Um, yeah. And she doesn't get a lot of court time, right? And and we often. You know, we're very sensitive. We know our players really well. We obviously know Chelsea really well now. And um, but she's playing in you know the second or third best women's professional league in the world. So she's playing against uh, uh, 23, 24 year olds who've played four years of college basketball and then played in the WNBA. She's playing against Jenna O'Hay, who's from Taralgon, who's 31 years of age and played in Europe and the US and so on. And I think the other thing that I see um, in the the country kids coming through is just the resilience piece to stick at things, because um, you know it's, you, you, most of the learning that Chelsea's had in reality over the last three years has been from the twenty hours of training she's doing a week. That's completely hidden, guy. It's fair to say from the people outside that you know she's getting to train one-on-one against Lindsay Allen, who plays for the Las Vegas Aces in the WNBA and was the captain of Notre Dame University for four years in uh, NCAA. Now, she doesn't get to... She might get to play um, a a very limited number of minutes in that league, but she's getting to train 20 hours a week watching how Lindsay prepares. So I think one of the things I'd say with someone like Chelsea is, and, and the link into the pathways is... Um, that's why I think it's such an important piece to have these uh, things like the WNBL and to have the boomers because it really does create whatever level you're going to get to, a connection between, you know, that young boy or girl who's 12 sitting in sale or wherever they are um, and they know a Chelsea D'Angelo at the age of 20 can be doing not just the basketball piece but she's combining that with studying law, which is just a pretty remark. I mean, you think about that. That's mm. that's high achievement, both on and off the court. Yeah. No, it's um absolutely, and um, I mean, we know in um the the Gippsland community appreciates when um there are organisations like yourselves that come down and and um have a presence in Gippsland um and have a, then a, a connection to the not only the player pathway, but, you know, the elite teams. So that's great. Um, Thank you both so much for your time. It's been a really fascinating chat and um, insightful. And um, is there anything else you would like to add before we we say goodbye? Well, a couple of things from my end. um, We're we're working through, we've been, um, had a very close relationship with Gippsland uh, the last two and a half years. Um, We think we've got some exciting announcements coming up in the next couple of months about what's going to happen in the next 12 months, particularly in the next WNBL season and 
Okay. Obviously, with your new facility at Tarragon. Um, we won't say too much about that because You're I not going to give uh, us a scoop right now? <laughs> uh, well, maybe you might have us back. Um, but, you know, we, we certainly yeah. we, we were thrilled to be down there the last couple of years. Um, we were, <clears throat> in a sense, humbled to come down and in February spend some time post the bushfires mm. and, uh, and make a small contribution ourselves. And we look forward to continuing being involved, to, to your point, Michelle, in the community piece as much as in the elite end because um, because we really enjoy it. Yeah, great. Great, you thank it? you so much. Yeah, uh, the only thing, June, I think that uh, before we kind of got locked down into COVID-19, that um, two of our players, Ezzy Magbegore and Matty Garrick and myself, filmed a bunch of... Um, basketball clinics, sort of short eight to ten minute pieces, which are on the um, the Boomers Facebook page. So okay. if uh, there is a, a young basketballer, particularly female basketball out there that is looking for additional information on basic skills of the game, uh, go and find those videos and and hopefully uh, they will they will help. Yep, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And again, thank you both for your time today. It's been um, it's been fantastic chatting. And um, we look forward to seeing you back down in Gippsland once we get through this um, COVID-19 situation. Pleasure. See Thank you, you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Okay, we're on to our next guest now, Damon Francis, um, who works for Gipps Sport as a community sport planning officer. Damon's got an extensive background in community sport. He's worked at all levels in a whole range of different sports, including soccer and AFL. Um, he's come to us um, with a background as being a sports journalist and also working for AFL Gippsland in more recent years as well. And Damon works with us two days a week on our Increasing Access to Sport project, which has been looking at the barriers to sport for 12 to um, 18 year olds, which has been um, really a fantastic journey for us. And Damon, since you've been working on the project, what have you found most surprising about the research so far? Thanks, Michelle. Hi, Jean. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's been a fantastic project. I've sort of come in halfway through, um, so I get to do the fun stuff of, uh, of testing some of the, uh, the research that we've found. But um, probably the first thing to note um, is there weren't a whole lot of surprises in the research. Um, cost of sport, difficulties getting to and from games and training sessions, uh, the seriousness or perceived seriousness of sport were all pretty prevalent. Uh, and a significant portion of respondents said they were time poor with uh, increased study expectations, part-time jobs and driving lessons, all factors. Um, probably what was surprising was the perception of sport among youth in the Trove Valley. Um, there were those who participated in sport and had a positive or negative experience. And then there were those who had not participated and a lot of the common barriers were social and psychological pressures, uh, such as fear of judgment of their fitness levels or skills or, or not fitting in. Um, so what I really took from it is that there's no one solution to increasing access to sport for young people. Uh, addressing costs will help some people but not others. Um, providing transport will help some but not others. Uh, and some of these solutions require resources that clubs may not have access to. But uh, there are things that we can control, such as creating a positive environment and, and that young people will be more inclined to participate in. Thanks for joining us, Damon. Um... So how would you, if, if there was a local coach out there at the moment uh, watching, um, how would you define positive coaching? Yeah, it's a fair question. Positive coaching is, uh, in a structured sense, it's a method of coaching that empowers parents, coaches, teachers, and other sport leaders and facilitators to help create a more positive environment for young people. So it's about moving away from the win at all cost mentality and focusing instead on effort, respect, and responsibility. So that's achieved by helping educate young people about winning and losing and cooperation, while at the same time encouraging them to learn and develop new skills. The idea that winning in life and winning in sport is achieved through effort. Um, but I think more broadly and, and probably more importantly, uh, in the context of grassroots community sport, positive coaching is a philosophy that lends itself well to ensuring ongoing participation. Um, so improving skills is kind of a happy byproduct of, of a positive coaching approach. So when we're talking about grassroots sport, particularly in regards to young people, it's important to provide opportunities for growth and skill development, but it's also so much more than that. It's about providing a sense of belonging and an opportunity for social connection, to spend time with friends and to be active and healthy and have fun. Yeah, it's really um, 
interesting probably we're all reflecting on what we're missing most about our community sport at the moment and I think that social connection is really important but yeah that sense of fun and um, just enjoying sport for what it's what it's meant to be about and when young people say to us they just want to have have fun when they play sport what do they mean do you think? Well fun is different for everyone but I think we can all agree that having fun is almost always about feeling like you're able to be involved to the level that you want to to be able to express yourself and um, and that people want and value you being there. So um, just just being there is is uh, is enough. Um, we can also probably answer that question by looking at what's not fun. So being afraid to make mistakes, being told you're not good enough, not getting much game time, not feeling like you have any say in your experience, or feeling like you're letting the team down if you can't make a training session or a game. These things, um, I don't think anyone really finds any of that fun. Um, it's quite anxiety inducing and it's social and psychological pressures that none of us want or need in our lives. Um, so it can be a real turn off if sport is, is that experience for you. Um, some people want to be the best. They want to be front and center of the action, improve their skills and progress through the ranks into pathway programs. Whereas others just want to play, spend time with friends and have fun. Uh, some kids might want to have a laugh with a teammate or, or even an opponent when something happens, like you're missing, miss an easy shot or you drop a catch or you fall over um, rather than getting frustrated or upset. So um, maybe even you just want to have a chat when the player's at the other end of the ground and, or, you know, not just before or after the game. So um, in terms of training, there are ways you can improve skills and fitness uh, without making kids run laps or do 100 push-ups or repeat the same drill over and over again. Um, you can play a game where there's lots of running or skill application. So there's ways to make things fun, um, but also achieve skill and fitness development at the same time. So, so again, that's the, the positive coaching approach to making sure the sport is fun yeah it's interesting Damien you you mentioned about um having a different view on how sport looks and we're we're conditioned that you know it's a competition um you know like you mentioned about you know um uh, interacting with your opponents um doesn't have to be quite um stringent I I actually recall a um a um a story that a parent was telling me that um, their son was playing soccer and the opposition hit this beautiful free kick and he actually went up and shook the opponent's hand and just applauded <laughs> him. And the parent was mortified, <laughs> thinking, you know, oh, but, you know, um, that was just how he reacted. He appreciated it and why why do we see that as wrong? So, yeah, it's interesting perspective. Um, my next one question, um, I was really interested to, to hear about about this as, as a possible idea and um, in the current situation with COVID-19 it might actually be easy to do but um, the idea of a silent round can you explain what that is? Yeah well, as you mentioned silent round might be the new normal for a while given the uh, current situations and restrictions regarding crowds at uh, community sport but basically a silent round is about minimising the involvement of, of parents and coaches on the sideline on, sidelines on match day so um, it's uh, parents are still able to, to cheer. So you can celebrate a goal, you can clap, you can say, yay, well done. But it's it's trying to get them to stop um, shouting at, at players to, to run faster or run harder or go and get the ball or go in harder or anything like that, cutting those comments out. Because um, what we've found in our research is that kids actually do notice that stuff a lot of the time. And uh, I don't think I know anyone who uh, runs faster because they're told to run faster. More often than not, when you're chasing the ball, you just want to go and get the ball. You're not thinking about, you're already, you know, doing the best you can. You're running as fast as you can. You're, you're trying to get it as best you can. So um, if we can minimise um, that sort of noise on the sideline, particularly the negative comments, but you start by pairing it right back and getting people to think about the sorts of things that they're saying, um, that can make a real difference. So it's something that's been done um, in a uh, soccer competition in New South Wales has done it. Okay. A junior footy competition in South East Melbourne tried it last year. Um, and it's just about, uh, it's about bringing your, uh, your parents and, and community along for the ride. Um, so it's clearly explaining to them what you're trying to achieve and how you're going about it. So you might provide them with um, a flyer or, or a letter or something like that. Just sort of details um, what they are allowed to do, what they're encouraged not to do, and um, and, and why you're doing it. Um, and so, you know, we, we don't necessarily know it works, but like I said, what has been said is that 
it can make a difference to kids, um, judging by our research and, and uh, contribute to their negative experience uh, of participating in sport. So if we can, um, yeah, see if that makes a difference, uh, it could be really beneficial and something for, for clubs and, and leagues to think about. Yeah, and um, often it's brought up too, not only what's happening on the sidelines, but what um, conversations happen in the car on the way home as well. It's something mm. that parents can always think about um, how they can have that positive reinforcement on the enjoyment of the game and what they're taking away from it. Um, so that, yeah, the idea of a silent round, that's um, something we're going to discuss more in our positive coaching workshop, I think, next on um, early in June. Yeah, so we um, we held a positive coaching workshop in late February, uh, a few weeks before the world got turned upside down. Uh, and with social distancing still in place, we decided to offer an online version, um, maybe with uh, club volunteers and coaches uh, looking to, to upskill during this time. Um, so at that workshop, we'll share some skills and, uh, sorry, some tips and techniques on applying a, a positive coaching philosophy. But it's also about getting our local coaches and sports facilitators to think more broadly about their participants who might be um, who might be involved at their club, or who they might who might not be involved in their club, and why? Um, and, uh, and and when it comes to appointing coaches, to think about the sort of person that you're looking for, and and to also think about what your club stands for and what you want, um, how you want your your uh, leaders to interact with players, to encourage them to be involved longer term, and and make sure that they feel valued. Um, you know, it could be something as simple as making sure at the end of the season. You contact all of the players and, and let them know that uh, you really enjoyed them being part of the, uh, the club this year and, and that you hope that they'll be involved again next year and, and then they might walk away feeling like they uh, want to come back. Um, so that's on Monday the 1st of June at 6 o'clock. Uh, it will take place via Zoom um, and it will be short and sharp. It will be over in about half an hour and then allow a little bit of time for some, uh, for some chat at the end hopefully. But we want it to be a fairly engaging session as well. So... Uh, for people to share their thoughts and their experiences as well so we can all learn from each other because that's a really important part of uh, of the positive coaching movement is to to get people to share these ideas and um, and hopefully encourage others to to adopt that uh, that mindset thanks so much damon um yeah the the research is yeah, really insightful and um i think the practical examples that you talk about are what um you know myself as a community coach i can relate to them and i'm sure others can um, well, that's it for episode three. Um, thanks so much, Damon, for joining us. Uh, again, thanks uh, Guy and Tony from uh, the Deakin Melbourne Boomers for joining us as well. Um, please follow us on Facebook um, and we've, uh, Gipsport has created a forum which we're hoping for club people to get on and uh, discuss um, the topics that are on there and perhaps even give us feedback on what... Um, future podcasts they want discussed as well. So until then, everyone, have fun, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. For more information on Between Games, visit www.gipsport.com.au. Between Games is supported by Vic Health and the Department of Health and Human Services. Gipsport, supporting community sport.